My name is Simon Conway Morris. I work in the University of Cambridge. And what do you do there? Um, ostensibly, I'm meant to teach paleontology, and I still do a little bit of that, but I have quite a wide interest in evolutionary biology. Okay, and are we alone in the universe? We don't know. Um, the consensus is that we're not, and that would seem very reasonable for a number of... What are those reasons? Why uh, is They would include the uh, inevitability of life evolving, given the abundance of the necessary elements. There are, of course, some details in this which might need to be unpacked. And the likelihood that there are a large number of habitable planets and moons, and that's even taking a relatively narrow view of where life may end up. So overall, the numbers and the probability of life evolving would suggest that we should not be alone. But, the, but there's a two different, there are two different factors there. One is lots and lots of habitable planets, and the other hand is the probability of life. Indeed. They're kind of discrete things. So, so let, and it, everybody seems to agree on lots and lots of planets, but they don't necessarily agree on the probability of life. Could you unpack that a little bit? Uh, why do you think it's high, or why do most people think it's high, or why do you think it's low, or what? Well, I have no particularly informed opinion for the simple reason I don't work in the area. I followed the literature for some time. Um, to the first approximation, um, one would say progress in this area has been relatively slow. Um, but that's uh, perhaps a reflection of the relative lack of investment and indeed the complexity of the problem. Um, what one would observe is, I think, that in terms of the basic building blocks, uh, those are formed in pretty well unexceptional conditions and often very widely. This is all very familiar to people. Um, and also the uh, endpoint, the functioning cell, is understood to a very high level of detail now. Of course, the devil lies in the details as to how these things assemble or self-assemble. And it's not something I'm really confident to say. Um, one can make the argument, in fact, that life itself, in terms of its origin, is just a complete and utter fluke. You just have to have a very, very large number of habitable surfaces, and on one or two of them, by fortuitous set of circumstances, maybe even particular minerals which are unique to certain planets, or at least rare, that these things then provide substrates for life to then assemble. But this is pure conjecture, and it's not my area at all. I think, being at this meeting here in Tokyo, one gets a sense of more optimism in much there has been quite a bit of progress in the last few years in comparison to perhaps the decades beforehand. Are you saying that there are lots and lots of planets, there are lots and lots of the ingredients are everywhere, but we're not quite sure about the recipe? Maybe it's a simple recipe, maybe it's a complicated recipe? That's absolutely correct, yes. But again, I'm, I'm not the person to say. Um, all I can observe is that scientists have a unique ability to identify a problem and approach it from often surprising directions and crack it and uh, the relative lack of progress suggests that perhaps we are not quite putting the questions in the right order, or alternatively, it may well be that some of the basic steps in synthesis occur maybe on comets, which of course are relatively inaccessible at the moment, uh, and therefore until we either decide to produce experiments which are based on organic rich ices, for example, um, rather than worrying about uh, hot sea vents or clay minerals or sulfide minerals, then maybe that's the sort of place which would be more instructive. Okay, so let me, so I asked you, are we, let me ask you again, are we alone? Well, I, I personally, I suspect we are. You think we are alone? I um, why do you suspect that? Uh, that's more to do with the likelihood of intelligence is evolving, and we can unpack this if you so wish. And then if intelligences lead to technologies, which again may not be inevitable, um, then in due course one would have technologies which would be interested in interrogating the world around them, aka science, but also ultimately exploring other parts of the galaxy in which the home star is located. So you think, you suspect that we're alone because of the potential uniqueness of human intelligence? That could be one possible argument. Um, it's also possible life is a fluke. Or it's also possible, of course, if intelligences do lead to technology, but they self-destruct. There are a number of options. If life is a fluke, where does the fluke line? Which part of the origin of life from geochemistry to cells? Well, I couldn't say. A fluke is a metaphor, of course. I mean, one was really saying that there's a concatenation of circumstances which have to be highly specific to allow things to assemble in a particular sort of way. Can you identify uh, where this, in this concatenation of circumstances there would be a bottleneck and where there wouldn't be? I mean, Not particularly, no. In fact, my instinct goes in the opposite direction. I mean, there's one set of hypotheses which have argued, in fact, that one of the principal early reactor chambers were actually tiny sort of bubble-like structures which are produced when waves break and these are wafted into the atmosphere. And calculations suggest um, that the numbers produced are astronomical.
and if each one is a tiny reaction chamber which then descends perhaps having gone to a certain height and has a certain interior chemistry subjected to ultraviolet radiation or a particular salinity returns to the ocean then if you like the number of trials is exceedingly large so everything we think we know about the likelihoods uh, point to the inevitability of life evolving and quite likely on diverse sorts of planetary surfaces. So you, so I guess we agree that there are lots and lots of planets out there, but what the controversy is, is to what extent the origin of life is a fluke, mm. but you tend to be leaning towards it being probable just because you can't identify any specific bottleneck? That's correct, yeah, but again, I emphasize I'm not an expert in this area, I'm not a chemist. I'm a sort of evolutionary biologist, and I'm interested especially in the evolution of intelligence, brains, all those sorts of good things. And because I think I can make some arguments that those have a rather high probability, and perhaps misguidedly imagine that some will develop into fully-fledged civilizations, again, there may be a set of intermediate steps which are more difficult than we realize, um, then sooner or later uh, these civilizations will choose to engage in a little bit of nearby exploration and eventually a galactic diaspora. And to date, we have no evidence of that. Now, since you are an evolutionary biologist, um, and uh, there's an interesting argument in astrobiology that says if you can identify something that has evolved independently multiple times on Earth, then that would be a good candidate for something that we should expect to be a feature of extraterrestrial life. It, is that right? I seem to remember making that argument myself. Yeah, okay, so that seems like a good argument to me except that you and I have a very strong disagreement about multiple, how can you identify multiple independent examples of something. For me, um, these things like eye, eyeballs or flight or what have you, since life has a common origin, anything that you, rec you identify as uh, independent, there will be a common ancestor which will, I think, necessarily have a proto-version of whatever you've identified as independent examples of an eyeball or a brain or a flight. So can we unpack your version of that? Well, I can't disagree with that. I mean, there is a possibility, albeit remote, that life has more than one origin. No, not, not life, but anything that, like saber teeth or oh, yes, the things that you have in your convergent books. Sure, sure. Yes. Um, no, th that, that's true enough. I mean, th th there are a series of um, prior conditions. And so if we want to talk about uh, convergence in mammals, then one realizes that if they're equipped with a particular sort of skull and particular jaws and teeth, then correspondingly, if these teeth are involved with different sorts of digestion, uh, then the emergence of the saber tooth is um, something which uh, is not entirely unexpected. But one can put a slight uh, turn on that, if you like, because the, the saber tooth is a very uh, celebrated example of convergence in as much as the marsupials and the placental mammals to us kangaroos and mice, if you like, have arrived at a very similar solution. And from well, that perspective... But, but, there, but let me stop you there, because unpack the statement. Mm. When you say they've arrived at a similar solution, the implication is that it was independent arrival. In my world, those two have a common ancestor, I think about 160 million years ago, which whose com that common ancestor had regulatory mechanisms to change teeth size and shape, which reptiles yeah. didn't have. But the, but those two, that answer, common ancestor did. And if that's mm. the case, then, then we already have the ability to move things up and down very easily in a restricted fashion, which would lead to, hey, two mm. saber tooth, two saber tooths and two supposedly semi, but not really independent mm. species because they shared that regulatory mechanism. That's true, and that's one way of looking at it, and it's one level of explanation. I have no quarrel with that But that's deep homology, not independent evolution. Well, deep homology itself, of course, is, is a, a somewhat slippery concept. Um, one might return, first of all, to the, 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 the thought that if one's interested in the anatomical sophistication of these particular arrangements, then if you look at the common ancestor, which lived in the Jurassic, it, it has teeth, but it has no other sort of particular things other than it has what we call heterodonty. In other words, it has molars and canines and incisors and that sort of thing. And of course, so it has genes that control the different shapes well, and sizes of those teeth already. But, well, that's true, but of course, those genes themselves are often used for various other functions, and you necessarily you, you have a, a regulatory mechanism, otherwise you won't end up with teeth. But it's not at all clear that the genes are necessary, even if the saber-tooth marsupial and the saber-tooth placental use the same gene package. And in fact, that's actually relatively unlikely. There would certainly be a number of differences. What actually matters is in terms of the behavior, the ecology, and the anatomy of these particular creatures. They themselves are coordinated with a whole series of other changes. 
And specifically in the case of the marsupial saber-toothed cat, they belong to a group we call the thylacosomelids, with admittedly an incomplete fossil record. Um, the fact of the matter is that they evolved from something which looks approximately like an all-purpose dog, a so-called boar hyenid. Mm -hmm. And um, the degree of morphological divergence towards this saber-tooth arrangement is remarkable in terms of it is an extreme departure to something which then turns out to be surprisingly similar to the placental saber-tooths, which themselves have independently arrived at that solution, maybe three, perhaps four times, maybe even more, and also are actually re-evolving that arrangement even as we speak. Okay, but let, let's yeah. most of the people who are interested in the question, are we alone, uh, imagine, they're, they're not that interested in finding bacterial aliens, they're more interested in finding aliens with whom they can speak. Who well, are they benign, well, yes, but I can who interrupt you. They, they won't be able to speak unless they have their bacteria in the gut. <laughs> so do remember <laughs> okay. that it's not simply a monotonic thing whereby, you know, the bacteria are the launch pad. The oh. bacteria are integrated completely in any complex biosphere. Okay, um, so let's talk to the audience and say, Let's replay the tape of life in Stephen Jay Gould's analogy, and maybe as far as I know, it might be your uh, worldview as well, that you go back Cambrian or even pre-Cambrian and say, if we did that on Earth, everything else is as far as, you know, we're not gonna put the continents and the winds in the exact positions, but we're gonna do mm. things that are fundamental, put them in the same place, and then let life re-evolve. Replay the tape of life. Do you think something like human-like intelligence would evolve again? I think it would in as much as we have human-like intelligence of a sort, not only in our close relatives, which is unsurprising because of course we share common ancestors, but also notwithstanding your comments about deep homology, we find uh, analogous systems in the birds, famously the parrots and the corvids, but also in more remote uh, groups which certainly are evolutionary relatively distant, um, albeit still animals such as the octopus. But, but, but wait a minute, but do we have a common ancestor with these corvids and some birds. Uh, I hope so. Uh, about 360 million years ago or so, isn't that? There about. Something yes, like that. Yeah, that's right. So, in so yeah. and that common ancestor had a brain. Yeah. It was bilaterally symmetric. It had some interesting features, and it had regulatory mechanisms that control the sizes of these things. True. Yes. Yeah. Again, oh. that's, that's a level of explanation, and there's nothing wrong with it, but I don't think it's a sufficient level of explanation. I mean, of course you've got to have reg regulatory mechanisms. And if, to the first approximation, of course, evolution is lazy, so it will re-employ these as and when necessary. Mm -hmm. But it's not a universal rule. And what right, we do right see right. is if, if for some reason, there's a famous example in the um, uh, methods of olfactory uh, recognition by insects, where you would expect them to use a G-coupled protein receptor. And indeed, they do have something which looks exactly like a G-coupled protein receptor, except it is patently independent. Well, 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 well pa nothing is patently independent because oh, everything has a common ancestor. Well, yes, in, in as much as they, they use amino acids, but the proteins which are employed are unrelated well, entirely to the... Uh, yes, I mean, well, you, you, can you can keep on chasing it back and insist that because everything comes from number one bacteria sometime in the Archean, Yes. But I think most evolutionary biologists would not regard that in any way as sort of constraining everything which has to happen subsequently, which I think I is what you're driving at. Well, I don't think you have to chase it back that far. I think the common ancestor is far enough. Well, any case, be that as it may, um, I would imagine that because we have, albeit relatively rarely, the evolution of large brains and these, although it's not a precise correlation, in fact it's rather imprecise, but there is some sort of correlation with cognitive sophistication which goes with larger brains. Well, let's suppose that in the universe and all these other planets that, that life does get started. What fraction of them will have anything that you would call, I don't know, human-like intelligence or techno or civil or, or what's you civilizations or a brain able to make a telescope or a microscope or something like that? Well, we're asked to look at the so-called Drake equation, and the answer, of course, is we don't know. But one can make. Uh, Why is that? The, of course, the answer. We I thought we had some evidence called the dog that didn't bark. Uh, well, that may be the Fermi the, paradox. That, yeah, that may indeed be correct, but of course, being scientists, we're well aware that we might be using the wrong search images or maybe looking in the wrong sorts of places. Right. Uh, and even the change in emphasis to the uh, assumption, more or less, now that anything which will be an extraterrestrial will be in the form of a machine based intelligence. Now, at the moment, because of the rapidity of technological change on this planet, um, this marries very much with our expectations of what the next few centuries hold. But it may be in a few centuries' time when we get to that stage, um, it may turn out that this too is hopelessly naive. I mean, no, I'm, it's not a complaint. It's merely that one is, in a certain sense, trapped in one's own historical memories 
and it's always difficult to think out of the box. Well, I'm confused. Let me ask you Good. the question again. Uh, and the, if let's suppose then that there is life elsewhere, what fraction or how much of it should we expect to have the type of intelligence that could build a spaceship or a radio telescope? Well, again, we don't know. What we can see is that in a number of groups, from my viewpoint, effectively independently, have arrived at sophisticated cognition. It remains the case that human cognition seems to have some unique elements about it, and most of my colleagues would regard this as a qualitative difference. Uh, sorry, as, a, as, as a, I, I let's have to try and describe it. Uh, well, I would regard it as, yes, if you like, a qualitative difference. This is one of, of degree rather than kind. Okay, so if I've understood what you said, then you would, it would be much more likely on these other planets that some a cognition would evolve, kind of like a parrot or, a, or an ape, but not much with much less likelihood a human-like intelligence that could build a telescope. Well, this is now my, 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 my I think is actually possible, uh, but in that sense, my, my thinking has, has changed. That's fine. Um, I am allowed to change my mind, which some people don't particularly approve of, but they'll have to live with that, won't they? Um, um, but if one follows the general assumptions, which may well be correct, that um, in our own particular case, the differences between ourselves and chimpanzees is wafer thin, and in a certain sense it's fortuitous whether chimpanzees evolved into humans or some other group, then if we've reached that stage of evolution, and that in its own way seems to be a relatively unexceptional, as already mentioned, because convergence suggests that large brains are uncommon, but not that uncommon, then the next stage towards a human intelligence which has an interest in building radio telescopes should not in itself be particularly surprising. So, so far as the Drake equation goes, then one would say that perhaps, for the sake of argument, 50% of planets which produce life uh, also ultimately produce um, some sort of um, cognitive species. Well, some sort of, I'm trying to make the distinction. I, th I thought you were making a sharp distinction between some sort of cognitive species and human-like intelligence. Well, at the moment, my, my thinking is, 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 is in, in development. I can't put it more strongly than that. Um, as we were discussing earlier here in Tokyo, um, um, I, I think there's an argument to be made. There is something very, very unusual about human intelligence, but I certainly don't, and perhaps you don't either, understand what it is which really separates ourselves from even our closest relatives, and there's a long list of um, cognitive uh, apparatus which broadly revolve around the so-called theory of mind. But the question is, how likely is that to evolve? It should be very, very likely indeed. It's obviously evolved with us, and it's not clear to most people what it is which um, the chimps don't seem to have quite got to, which we'd have. And it may simply be that we're first on the block and therefore a little bit surprised we are. Okay, so let's talk about the Planet of the Apes uh, movie that uh, we both love so much. Now, let's suppose, not, not implausibly, that there's World War Three or World War Four, and we kill ourselves, all the humans, or we marginalize ourselves somehow, just like in the movie. Uh, so do you think that something else will evolve to fill what is sometimes called the intelligence niche, which we think we inhabit? I would imagine it's very likely, yes. Oh, how many millions of years? We know that our brain in increased by a factor of three in about three or four million mm. years. So uh, how long, do you think that's a typical time scale for well, it's difficult to know. I mean, there's a sort of analogy which one can look at in the dolphins and the other toothed whales, and there, because the fossil record is relatively good, uh, I think, uh, re remembering crudely, that the intervals you're talking about are in the order of 20 million years, thereabouts. Okay, so you think if we have World War Three or Four or Five and we kill ourselves, that on the order of five to 30 million yeah. years, something will evolve into this intelligence niche and start making cameras and telescopes and microscopes. Well, unless we are uh, utterly disastrous and effectively destroy all the primates, and of course in the case of the great apes, um, they're already in a very precarious position. But in other cases, amongst the monkeys, the populations are perhaps less threatened. So if we want to use that as our starting point, then if we assume, and this may not be correct, um, that um, ape divergences occur in the Miocene, and again we're talking about approximately 20 million years. Okay, let's kill everything on the land and we're dealing with uh, octopi or something. Is that the most intelligent invertebrate and is, is that going to evolve into human-like intelligence? Um, it, it's possible, in which case we probably have to allow, you know, hundreds of millions of years. Are you okay with this noise here? That's, that's all right. Yeah, so, you, so you think, in any case, you're, in, you're working in a model in which human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution? 
I'm working on the model that large brains which show cognitive sophistication are things which do evolve multiple times. How do you explain then Australia and New Zealand and South America in which have 50 to 100 million years of independent evolution and yet and they had brains there and there was no suppression of the brains to evolve into the intelligence niche, but they didn't. I on timescales larger than the things that you just quoted. I don't think that's correct, in fact. I mean, in the case of South America, for example, of course, they were colonized by what we now call the New World Monkeys about 35 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And they have a series of interesting parallels to what happens uh, in the so-called Old World. And so if we look at some of the uh, New World Monkeys, um, Capuchin in particular, um, they have tool making, which in its own way is probably as sophisticated as what you see in the chimpanzees. Their smaller body sizes and their brain size isn't quite as big. And then there are all sorts of little details here which need necessarily detain us. Because they had 35 to 50 million years of independent evolution to evolve telescopes, and they didn't. No, we're not asking to evolve telescopes. Well, when, you, when I say evolve into the intelligence niche, I was referring to the one that builds telescopes. Yes, yeah, true enough, and that's only happened once. Right, and it happened on a time scale that we can we look at maybe five million years, and so there are many intervals yeah. of five million years for these in New World monkeys to evolve telescopes, or Not the kangaroos to telescopes, or no, the well, Madagascar lemurs to evolve we, telescopes, we, or anything we, else. We wouldn't look at either Australia because it's effectively marsupial based, and, and there are probably some restrictions on what the marsupials can do. But again, really? I mean, yes, it, I don't want to disappoint your Australian restrictions on, <laughs> no, restriction on everything, unfortunately. I mean, in fact, in point of case, this is not necessarily an entire divergence. So obvious differences in the reproductive um, arrangements of the marsupials and the placentals. So you think those arrangements and constraints would prevent the evolution into the human-like cognition? They, they might do, because, of course, effectively, the difference in the placentals is that the young remains within the mother for a much more protracted period, and they don't have the complex placentas which are part of that story. However, having said that, in fact, there are, if you like, um, tendencies, in the bandicoot in particular, where that is effectively moving towards a placental-like arrangement. And again, I'm not, I'm not particularly concerned about this detail or that detail. What I'm interested in is the emergence of particular biological properties. And if you look across the planet, one sees the things which are more or less regarded as the wish list for ultimately a species which is going to build radio telescopes, which might include placentation. At one level, there'll be various aspects of the physiology. There'll be things like brain size. There'll be the ability to manipulate things. There may well be the way in which you become bipedal and so forth. And the point about all of these is that they've evolved several times at least. And therefore, one might say that you need to have a very special combination which allows that stage which leads to a technological species. But that's not really the point. I'm, I'm not, from this perspective, I'm not desperately interested in which species does it. I'm not desperately interested in the time scale. All I can observe is that, as mentioned, the wish list you need for a technological species has um, been as assembled um, a number of times independently. Indep and so I would challenge the word independently yes, indeed. severely. We've, we've been through here this before. But, right. Um, yep. But you say, so exactly what do you mean by the word independently in your last sentence? Well, because I think our, dis our, our divergence of opinions here is broadly around the role of deep homology mm -hmm. and the extent to which one is constrained by uh, genetic mechanisms. But I think myself this is a complete misreading of the evidence. I mean, but, but you said the word independently. What yes. exactly did you mean by that? Well, exactly what I said. Uh, you're not the denying the common, the common ancestors. The common ancestors did not possess the features such as tool making. And the fact they've appear, uh, emerged independently in these different groups sounds to me as if it's independent. But tool making, like almost anything that evolves, has a predecessor and a predecessor and a predecessor and a predecessor. For example, if you have an eyeball, it has, there's a proto eyeball and a proto eyeball, and it, all the way back to almost just photosensitive pigments. So I don't quite understand you. I mean, I don't understand that if you don't use a stone, somehow you're not using a stone. That is not tool making. If well, you there's, there's no threshold to say, okay, now you're doing tool making and now you're not. There's well, a continuum there, and no, that continuum I, can be represented in the record. I the disagree entirely. I mean, I, either the, the, the New Caledonian crow is using a probe or it's not. And the great majority of corvids do not use tools. Interesting enough, you can teach them to use tools, though generally they're not as good as uh, rooks and ravens in particular, but they're not using tools, and therefore uh, that seems to be the end of the observation. Okay, so let, let's try to get a simple, simpler answer, I hope, or more understandable answer to this question. Should we expect aliens with radio telescopes? In principle, we should, but if we have aliens with radio telescopes, uh, this, of course, is simplifying uh, considerably, then um, as the Fermi paradox uh, 
points out, uh, there doesn't seem to be any ev evidence of their activity. So do you think that's evidence that they don't exist? Uh, well, as we all know, absence of evidence and evidence of absence are, need to be carefully distinguished. And of course, being scientists, we're aware, first of all, that our searches are being very limited and mostly very local. Uh, and of course, um, it may simply be that tomorrow, uh, most of what I've been talking about is completely redundant. <laughs> okay. Should we, expect a, should we expect aliens with radio telescopes? In principle, yes. In principle, what does that mean? Well, given what we know about our own evolution and uh, the, nat the nature of intelligence on this planet, ultimately the appearance of a species which is interested in building radio, te radio telescopes, um, it seems to be uh, reasonably high. How about English, speaking English? No. Um, okay, what's the difference between speaking English and building a radio telescope? Uh, everything, because English has historical roots which are specific to particular um, migrations in Asia around about 3,000 years ago. And building radio telescopes does not have a very specific historical and evolutionary I don't context? I think so, no. Radio telescopes, I believe, are based on physics, which we are told is universal. No, but the ability to build one uh, that we seem to have that no other species uh, seems to be a species-specific characteristic, and I would have thought that one should not go looking for species-specific characteristics elsewhere in the universe. Um, it's not a species-specific um, characteristic. Building radio telescopes? I don't think it is at all. One imagines that if you have a species which are evolving technologies and ultimately they observed things as indeed the Greeks did when certain substances were rubbed then they generated static electricity of course they didn't understand per se what that was. We're talking about homo sapiens here let's talk no, about No 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 I'm talking about any species which in the end has a curiosity to wonder why things um, work uh, in terms of physical principles. Which on earth only includes homo sapiens? So it appears yes. So it's species specific? No it's not species specific it happens to be our species that's not the same thing at all. Oh, can you help me unpack that? I'll do my very best, yes, exactly. No, what I'm saying is that our species has these capacities, um, and one can make the argument that um, given that we are cognitively uh, derived from the, from the apes, then our capacity to arrive at these uh, particular technological abilities is something which is uh, on the basis of, of, of an advanced cognition, which most people would argue is otherwise very similar to the chimpanzee. So are you saying that if we kill ourselves, then that the chimpanzees will start making telescopes after five, ten million years? I couldn't say whether it would be them or another group, and again, frankly, I'm not terribly interested. What I would argue is that if we one has tool-making species, then their ability to manipulate things is the first starting point to then in the investigation of the world around them, the recognition of electricity, radio waves, and from that, radio telescopes. Could I describe your viewpoint then as saying that human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution? I suspect they are, yes. So that would describe you, that's a fair statement of oh, It's your a point. perfectly fair statement. Again, we're, I'm perfectly well aware, as you are, that uh, n equals 1 in this particular case. And it may turn out that there's something very peculiar indeed about human intelligences, which is not the same as what we see even in our closest relatives. Ah, so then in, in which case we should not expect human like intelligence to be a convergent feature? If that turned out to be the case, but all one can say at the moment is that although that is my growing suspicion, if you talk to the great majority of primate um, biologists in particular, uh, they would emphasize emphatically the degrees of similarity rather than uh, what would otherwise be referred to as human uniqueness. I think we can unpack this, it will take hours and hours, and I'm not sure we'd be very much better informed at the end of it. Okay, what do you think of uh, Hollywood uh, interpretation, presentations of aliens? I don't see any, I don't watch films. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Have you ever seen a UFO? I don't think so. All right. And um, if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat, uh, you have to spend this money to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? I would return the money to the donor. Because? Uh, because I don't think our present uh, search strategies are ones which are going to be successful. So you think there's no way you can, po you can contribute to answering this question with an infinite amount of money? I, I think the amount of money, infinite or otherwise, is almost immaterial to the question. What you need to do is hire people with brains. They come Doesn't quite that cost cheap. money? So that Not very much, no. Nothing. It's remarkably cheap. Ah, you don't so need that amount of money. So you don't... So you think, okay. All right, so what kind of people... Let's say, okay, I'll give you $10,000. No, whatever. No, I'll give you a million dollars. There's a lot of... Less. So what are you going to do with the million dollars? I wouldn't be interested in that particular question. I mean, if people want to adopt particular research strategies, that's actually fine. And if this $100 million or whatever the sum is, is used to good purpose, apart from anything else, there'll be all sorts of unexpected spin-offs from these investigations. So... I have no quarrel with the investigations being made, and I wish these people the very best of luck. I suspect they won't find anything, but who am I to say? Well, wait a minute. Why wouldn't you say, hey, let's 
create a space-based interferometer to look at the chemical disequilibrium in potentially habitable planets and then look for the type of test, this chemical disequilibrium mm. test that Lovelock proposed like 50 years ago. Sure. Well, first rate. And, and, and yes, please. But that please. costs money. You, you wouldn't. No, no. no. I mean, I, if you wish to spend the money in that way, then. And I'm asking you, you though. No, no. I would not. I would not spend the money that way. I'm not. I don't think because of the Fermi paradox that in the end the results will justify the investment. It will certainly be, in terms of science, in terms of the investigation of exoplanets, of the greatest importance. I, I have no quarrel with that at all, but in terms of actually determining the existence of aliens, extraterrestrials, I think this is not the way to go about it. But wait a minute. You invoke the Fermi paradox, which is only valid if you think that aliens will evolve intelligence to make spaceships and radio telescopes. No, but that, that's not I think the Fermi paradox asks uh, whether this actually happens. That's a very different question. It's not saying anything about the probabilities. It's but the prob Fermi paradox is, where are they? Uh, and more that less, assumes yes. that they would have colonized the galaxy, which means they would have made spacecraft. Mm, no, not necessarily. No. It just asks what sort of alien might we wish to look for. And of course, at the moment, because effectively we are stuck in the medieval tradition of exploration, and I have no quarrel with that, we assume that people will boldly go forth in spaceships. Uh, that may, in fact, be completely erroneous. There may be other ways in which the universe is occupied um, by so-called aliens, which are un invisible to us. I don't know. For example? I don't know. But you said something about transcension in your talk. Well, I was mentioned in passing, yes. This is a somewhat sort of idiosyncratic idea. I forget the name of the principal author. I apologize for that. Um, and it's one possible explanation for the apparent absence of extraterrestrials. In other words, they are, quote, there, but, quote, invisible to, quote, us. Um, in other words, well, I don't, again, particularly care whether there's any mileage in this idea, but I do care very much indeed whether it's an idea worth talking about. Okay. What about the idea that you, uh, about we're, maybe we are simulated? Again, that's being suggested by a chap called Stephen Baxter, who I've not had the pleasure of meeting, but um, again, it, it's such an unlikely idea, but then science is quite good at dealing with ideas to uh, echo Niels Bohr's famous quote, I think your idea is absolutely mad. There's only one thing which worries me. I don't think it's mad enough. And uh, one certainly gets a sense, reading some physicists, that they understand that the limits of knowledge are very, very close indeed. And therefore, one keeps an open mind. What kind of aliens would you like to, to meet? I, again, I have no particular view on this. How about your I can't emotional side, I can't not your rational? Throw away rational side for a while. Let's just <laughs> emotionally answer this question. What time would you like? What kind of aliens would you like to meet? No, again, I, I, I have no view on this at all. No emotional view. No, none whatsoever. Why should I? So you don't. You, is this is the question? Are we alone? An important question. I think it's an interesting question, and I suspect the question when we finally, in some sense, solve it, will be utterly different from the one which people expect. The answer will be different. You think it's interesting, but how important? It depends on one's perspective. In some, in some, from some points of view, and I would share those, then it's the most important thing of all. In other respects, in fact, it's utterly trivial. Now, does this question ever come up in when you're teaching? Uh, not very often, but it's only because um, in Cambridge I'm mostly involved with teaching straightforward paleontology, um, and uh, that's absolutely fine. That's, that's what I'm paid to do, and that's what I enjoy doing. Uh, there are uh, aspects of astrobiology which are doing very well in the university at the moment, I'm pleased to say. Um, Didier and people like that are driving all sorts of areas um, forward, and I have some conversations with these people. Um, but again, the way I choose to work is uh, very much as a one-man show, and, and that's absolutely fine. I'm not a collaborator, by and large. Um, and uh, as I say, I, 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 I find all these questions intensely interesting, um, but I tend to take a somewhat detached view of them. But if you're doing paleontology, then you're probably as qualified or even more qualified to answer this question about whether we should expect uh, brains and high cognition and human-like intelligence. That seems to be the part of this question which you are more qualified in than almost anybody. Well, I've tried to present evidence, but almost entirely on the basis of other people's research, that such things are, are, are likely on, on any Earth-like biosphere. I'd be surprised if they don't evolve. You'd be surprised if they don't evolve. Okay, so, okay. Um, let's see. Did I, I ask you the question? Let me ask you again. What, what is your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? I don't think there are any aliens at all in the way which we would recognize them. 
I see. So there are aliens, but we can't recognize them. So uh, no, how, not, qu be? not quite that. Um, if there are aliens, I suspect from our present perspective, they would not be recognizable. So let's let's work under the hypothesis that there are aliens and that we cannot recognize them. How, what can humans do? Do you think, with an in, with an infinite amount of money or right. however less you want, however little you want, what can we do to recognize, open our brains and make? Well, them what, 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 what I suspect, but it's no more than that, and of course I'm not the person to answer the question because I'm not a physicist and I don't understand physics or mathematics, but um, from what I understand, um, there's quite a lot about the universe which we don't currently understand uh, in as much as it seems to be made larger things we cannot directly observe. And I'm not saying the solution lies there, but it reminds me that one should keep an open mind in these regards. Cool. I'm not saying that dark energy and dark matter somehow are tied up with the apparent absence of aliens. They may be, I couldn't possibly say, but the fact that one has such um, areas of ignorance uh, gives me pause for thought. In some movies, we, at the end, we find out that we are part of an alien. We just didn't know it. So that makes me think of, you know, that we have like, I don't know, 100 billion neurons inside your brain right now, none of which know that they're inside of a brain. I hope not. Now, do you think there's any way, what could that a single neuron do, to, or neurons collectively, or I guess just just one neuron. How could it figure out that it was inside your brain? It was a part of something larger. I don't think that's a meaningful question. I'm afraid because, well, because as you say, this, this, the, what, what, what we identify as self-consciousness is assumed to be an emergent uh, property of large collections of neurons. Not uh, I, one. I, probably not one. No, I wouldn't have thought so. Be but ten. I don't know because, again, um, you know, the, the argument would be that this thing is sort of infinitesimal gradations from something like Darwin's earthworm to ourselves, where one has some sort of nascent consciousness that then somehow becomes fully fledged. I, I think, for what it's worth, that looking at the question complete the wrong way around. So maybe this giant alien of which we are a part has such a high level of cognition that our level of cognition is tiny and therefore we're unable to realize that we're part of it? It, well, it is conceivable, of course. I mean, in a sense, if I understand you correctly, you're again driving to one sort of sort of virtual reality, or at least something whereby one is part of a system which otherwise remains unidentifiable. But I, I mean, if one wants to talk about that, but I'm not sure it's got much mileage from our present perspective. I don't know how to put the questions in any coherent way. Okay, let me ask you again the question, are we alone? I think we are alone from current expectations of what an alien would be like. Okay, do you think this is an interesting question? Of course it's an interesting question. All questions are interesting. All questions are interesting. Of course, <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't ask them. Okay. And only humans ask questions. Uh, okay, so is human-like intelligence a convergent feature of evolution? I think it will be. What do you mean will be? Because we don't know of other examples. And therefore one is making a prediction and science works on predictions. And why is it that on these other independent continents that are independent experiments in vertebrate evolution that we have not seen uh, evolution towards human-like cognition? Well, it's, it's a difficult question, but it may well be that if it happens the first time and it happens to be us, then we can't be too surprised it's us. But doesn't that solution assume what you're, tr what you're asking about? For example, you could say, it's awful. So we're the first sulfur-crested cockatoos in the universe. And, uh, well, wait a minute, is this a, are you a convergent feature of evolution? No, we don't know, but we're the first. Mm, indeed. Yes. But if you assume that this is your convergent, then you say we're the first. That, that seems yeah. like a, a assuming well, what you're trying to ask about. No, but that, that, may, that, that may be correct. But uh, all one can say is that what seems to be the underpinning of our cognitive success is identifiable in a variety of, from my perspective, unrelated animals. And the assumption is, and I'm not sure this is completely correct, that it is that progression, for want of a better word, which then leads to fully-fledged human sentience. Do you have fully-fledged human sentience? No, I don't think I do, and I'm not sure you do either, Charlie, in as <laughs> much as uh, we don't know what's going to happen, even in terms of our own evolution. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's important to try to understand other people, to put yourselves in their shoes. How about other species? What other animal would you like to be? <laughs> I'm very happy as I am. <laughs> I don't want to be anybody else. <laughs> All right. And I Let alone a sarfo-crested cockatoo. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>